Well, it's such a big weekend of football across the world, as I mentioned, but it doesn't get much bigger than El Clasico. Barcelona hosting Real Madrid in La Liga. It's a huge game for both clubs, as we know. We're delighted to say Graham Hunter, La Liga expert and author, uh, joins us on ESPN's Football Forecast. Uh, Graham, just looking ahead to this game, um, I don't think neither club's in exactly the place that they would love to be right now. Maybe Barcelona are quite worse off, though. No Lionel Messi, no Sergio Ramos, two of the huge figures of El Clasico over the last decade. How do you think that changes things? The beauty of this fixture, 247 in to Madrid and Barca playing, is that it will still thrill. Um, it'll be full of creative wit. Um, it'll be full of hatred, arrogance, invention, chutzpah. It will undoubtedly reward everybody who, who wants to view it because so much on the line, because it's never, ever, ever played looking for a draw. Not ever. You get a draw every now and again. Every about 100 matches, you get a 0-0 zero, zero draw. But the fact is that irrespective of whether every player was born a Barca sport or a Madrid sport, it doesn't matter. There are several, for example, who go into this. Um, Lucas, for example, wasn't born in Madrid. Absolutely wears that badge as if his life depended upon it. Um, now, if you look at Football Club Barcelona, the ones that rescued them during the midweek in the in the must-win game against Dinamo Kiev, the three Catalan captains, so important, Busquets, Pique, who scored Alba, who created it. They were born locally, Pique, within a decent goal kick of the camp. Now, to them, life or death, Bill Shankly, no. To them, their, their month, their, their, the first half of the season will be ruined if they lose. Pique, after the Dinamo game, was saying, well, now this makes it easier to win the Classical. We have to win the Classical. We'll go above Real Madrid if we do win it. Stadium will be full. Nobody even taught him about going above Real Madrid. It's somehow keeping, somehow holding, holding, holding on to Real Madrid's coattails, given the situations you pointed out that they're in, and then saying that the stadium is going to be full. No, it's not. But the Classical continues to defy expectations. Anybody who thinks that because there's no Ramos, no Messi, Messi the leading scorer in the fixture ever, Ramos, the guy who loved to kick Messi and get sent off. Them being absent for the first time in, I don't know how many years, since well, in 20 years, should have been the headline. But it's not. The headline is if Madrid come here and win, that'll be their fourth straight classical win, something they've not done. Fourth straight since 1965. And Graham, I'd love to know the sort of the emotions of the, the the people out there because often in football there's there's constant cycles. There's always another game week. It's always moving forward. Um, but when someone like or a game like this, a tentpole game like this turns up, it gives you that moment to kind of take stock again. And I feel like everyone's thinking about the current crisis, I guess, with with Barcelona and how they are going to move forward. But at the same time, not having Messi, and I, I know I always love uh, listening to you talk about the, the beauty of Messi as a footballer. For, for yourself as well, personally, is there an element of be, feeling, dealing with the mixture of being slightly saddened by the fact that these players aren't, aren't there anymore, in particular Messi, uh, and also the sort of cleansing of Barcelona going forward? Because there's a lot of young players, exciting players. And this is, this is an El Clasico that will be very different to so many that we've seen over the several years that you've been covering La Liga. I, I, you know, I, lived, I chose to live for the last 20 years in Barcelona. But that doesn't in any way make me a, a Barca fan. So I've had the privilege of going into each of the classicals that I've done, I mean, dozens, knowing that I'd be, in, in telling a story, in chronicling what went on, I'd be perfectly happy whichever team won, so long as there was flair, so long mm. as there was a beautiful story to be told individually, collectively, a great goal, a red card, it, it didn't matter much to me. Now, I agree with you that going into it, I still feel the same as that, but there's a fascination to learn, first of all, can Madrid do that? If they tuck Barcelona away, they go five points, clear of them. If they tuck Barcelona away, it's what big, bad, mean teams do. They see a fledgling rival where, okay, there might be green shoots in recovery, and then you just Bam, there's, there's one in the chin. Canvas for you. That's what big teams do. It's also the case that the first time Carlo Ancelotti took 
uh, Romerud said to Camp Now, he played Gareth Bale at centre forward. It was very early in the project when he had to work out what to do with Cristiano Ronaldo, Benzema, Bale. He played Bale at centre forward. They were beaten in the class goal. The Bale experiment at centre forward was ended very quickly. Did you understand what he was trying to do? He's coming back here for the first game in his reign, um, back in charge at Romerud, very much as, as, as a placeholder coach which is a horrible expression to have to use, because it's not my opinion, it's the way that Florentino Perez has treated him. Because mm. Ancelotti is patently one of the most successful, most interesting man managers of our time covering football, your time, my time. And he's also a very decent, interesting man that adds luster, that adds nourishment to football in general, not just to Real Madrid. So he's coming here with the knowledge that there are big signings, really big signings planned for the summer that comes. That unless he's definitely won a trophy, and I mean definitely won a trophy, he can be another one of those one season wonders at Real Madrid. So the classical for him is brilliant in terms of what they can do in the Liga in their position right now. It can be a brilliant statement for the players, the fans, for his president, his ultra demanding president Florentino Perez. But for him too, there's a lot at stake. So they come to camp now. I mean, listen. How many times on your show do you talk about a record that has stood that can go in a Saturday or Sunday game since 1965? That's not your regular chit-chat in the build-up to a big game. Mm -hmm. uh, for Football Club Barcelona, as you pointed out, it's the, the eye is drawn, if you're a neutral, the eye is drawn to, they aren't going to have probably the best centre-half playing. That's Araujo, the Uruguayan, who's a bit of a phenomenon and who within... A certain period of time, which I don't expect to be elastically long, will be playing in the Premier League. And you'll be talking about him each weekend. That's his objective. He's built for a Premier League club. Barcelona's debt is absolutely disgusting. And therefore, Arujo is, is even in his breakthrough couple of seasons, isn't here forever. That's for sure. No Pedri. That makes a difference. Pedri's played in a couple of classicals and lost them both because he's only a one-season <clears throat> excuse me, wonder at Barcelona so far. But he won't be fit. Jordi Alba came, I interviewed Alba in midweek after Dinamo Kiev came, and he had a, an ice pack this big. I don't know if he was limping or if he was dragging the ice pack because it's so heavy. Does he play? That's really crucial. How do they substitute uh, Araujo at centre-back? Eric Garcia has been sent off twice so far this season, usually susceptible to pace and then clutching his, dragging his opponent back. Well, have a little tickle at Vinicius, Eric, if you're going to be starting. But Gabby's the one that you're fixating on because um, we know about Ansu. He's the youngest scorer for Spain. He's the youngest scorer for Barcelona. He's the youngest ever scorer in the Champions League. His experience can't be flicked on like a switch, but his talent and his pace, those are, are, are givens. Gabby is tiring. You can see that the amount of times he's played Champions League, La Liga and Spain football. I mean, only turned 17 in August. That's beginning to weigh on him. He, he will start, I imagine. But the eye will be drawn to, can Ansu turn the tide in a match where Madrid are clear favourites? And can Gavi cope with his three fellas? Um, who are Modric, Casemiro and Tony Cruz? Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.